Do you know that NASA explores not only stars, planets, galaxies, or black holes? Hard to believe, but yes. The agency also works on discoveries here on our home planet Earth. So what has NASA recently discovered? Is there life under the ice? While they were analyzing data recently, they discovered something unbelievable hiding under Antarctica's ice. And this discovery not only changes everything we know about the whole water system of the Earth, but it may also help with research about life in space. Humankind's existence might depend on understanding Antarctica and its secrets. So, the recent discoveries reveal vital information about our survival. But before we continue, let's see how much you know about this place, where it's only ice as far as your eyes can see. Antarctica is one of the world's seven continents in the Southern Hemisphere. It's the fifth largest continent in terms of total area, and that means it's almost twice the size of Australia. Want to see real meteorites? Go to Antarctica! Due to its dry climate, Antarctica is one of the best places to observe space. But what's even greater is that you can find meteorites on the white surface of the continent. Scientists have already plucked about 45,000 meteorites from the ice, and they think they can see another 300,000. Since there aren't many terrestrial rocks there, it's easy for them to spot them thanks to their dark color. Antarctica's dry desert environment also helps preserve them, even the ones that fell to Earth more than one million years ago. And can you imagine any volcanic activity in Antarctica? It's hard. But this place is where fire meets the ice. West Antarctica is where most volcanic activity occurs. Scientists recently found that 138 volcanoes exist in West Antarctica alone. Wow! You would think that Antarctica is always cold, but no. Its coastal regions can get as warm as 50 degrees Fahrenheit. But have you ever wondered what Antarctica would look like if there were no ice? It may seem unimaginable now, but it was not always covered by ice. That was 34 million years ago, though, so nobody could tell how the continent's surface would be without the ice. But NASA changed that. They generated computer simulations and created the most accurate map of it as of today. What they saw was incredible. The continent was not flat at all, like it seemed. It's pretty bumpy with valleys, rolling plains, and high mountains. But this was nothing next to what they had discovered under Antarctica's ice. So, what is it? Drum roll, please. NASA found two new subglacial lakes. And what's even cooler about it is that they spotted these lakes from space. How is that? If your answer is high-tech satellites, then you're right. In 2003, NASA launched a satellite called IceSat. It measured ice sheet mass balance and cloud and aerosol heights. The satellite also helped create the ice-free map of Antarctica. In 2010, the European Space Agency launched the second satellite, Cryosat-2. It was for tracking the changes in the thickness of the ice. Then, in 2018, NASA launched the third one, IceSat-2, a follow-on to the IceSat spacecraft. It measured ice sheet elevation and sea ice thickness. It was NASA's most advanced Earth-observing laser instrument. It delivered the highest precision data. And when that was combined with the data from the other satellites, it was possible to spot these two new lakes near a pair of larger ones. But how is it possible that these lakes exist in the first place? The average thickness of most Antarctica ice is approximately 1.2 miles. However, it can get over 1.8 miles thick in some places, especially during the winter. So, you might think that there's nothing under there, but science says otherwise. It's not quite possible to see it with your bare eyes, but the continent's ice is slowly but constantly flowing in different directions under the force of its weight. But scientists could not figure out how water moved for many years. That started to change in 2007, when data gathered from the ice sat provided insight into what hides beneath the surface. 
they first discovered an entire network of meltwater lakes connected under Antarctica's fast-flowing ice streams. And there were hundreds of them. Scripps Institution of Oceanography glaciologist Helen Amanda Fricker figured that the elevation changes measured by ice sac happened because of the dynamics of these lakes. They did not hold meltwater statically. Instead, they were filling and draining continuously over time through a system of waterways. And as they did that, the ice above rose and fell. But where do they drain? The ocean, of course, and it drains a lot. A recent study, co-authored by Fricker, found that the drainage of one lake flushed as much as 198 billion gallons into the ocean in only three days. Countless mysteries about how nature works are still waiting to be solved. But finding the two new lakes will give scientists a better picture of how fast the Antarctic ice sheet will change as the climate gets warmer and how this will affect global ocean currents and sea level rise. The filling and draining cycle of the lakes also caused the ice sheet to suffer cracks and crevices. So, the information they find from these new lakes will also give them a better understanding of the damage on the surface of the ice. They will also be able to assess how this filling and draining system influences the speed at which ice slips into the oceans and seas. And that means they can evaluate how the added freshwater may alter marine ecosystems. This discovery may also suggest whether life is under the ice. Wow! Scientists drilled through about 3,504 feet of ice and found that water samples taken from one of the lakes contained approximately 10,000 bacterial cells per milliliter. Such a high number of bacterial life is a good sign because that means the icy waters might also support higher life forms, such as microanimals, and one of these new lakes might even be their home. But the most exciting thing is that the new lakes might help them understand whether life on other planets is possible. Scientists believe any life below the frozen surface of the planet Mars might follow the patterns seen in Antarctica's lakes. So, there is a possibility that they might find critical new information on the type of life that may have existed on the red planet. You wouldn't want to be there during the winter, though. The lowest temperature on Earth you can experience is negative 128 degrees Fahrenheit. In 2010, there was an even lower temperature of negative 135 degrees Fahrenheit. And you may feel this cold much worse due to the strong and dry winds. Did you know that the size of the ice surface on Antarctica also changes throughout the year? It's about 1.2 million square miles during the summer. But when it's winter, it grows to 7.3 million square miles. Yet, despite the change, it remains the largest piece of ice on Earth. Sorry, Arctic, you lose. Do you know these cute little penguins? Consider these animals the locals, because there is no native population in Antarctica. It's a no-man's land, because no single country owns it. But do you know who really owns it? Five different species of penguins, seals, and killer whales. Ha uh -huh. Despite the continent's harsh conditions, you can visit it as a tourist for fishing and research purposes. Around 5,000 people reside on the continent during summer at research stations. But when winter comes, the number naturally drops down to 1,000. Antarctica. We've all dreamed of visiting the Arctic and witnessing the natural wonders of polar bears frolicking on ice floes or the aurora borealis dancing across the sky. Well, sorry to break it to you, but you won't find any tourists flocking to Antarctica anytime soon. Why, you may ask? Let's dive into it. First off, where is Antarctica? It's located in the Southern Hemisphere, specifically at the South Pole. The Southern Ocean surrounds it, and most of the continent is covered by ice, making it one of the most remote and frigid places on Earth. Now, have you ever met someone who's visited Antarctica? Probably not. It's one of the least visited places on the planet, and only a handful of lucky explorers have seen its interior, which is mostly made up of glaciers and ice fields. But trust me when I say the wildlife and scenery are out of this world. Why shouldn't you travel to Antarctica? Well, for starters, the environment is incredibly fragile and can be easily damaged. Plus, there are no native human populations on the continent. 
So your travels would essentially be like visiting an uninhabited island. And let's not forget that it's also one of the most expensive destinations to travel to. Despite all that, Antarctica is not exactly guarded like a fortress, but there is an international agreement called the Antarctic Treaty. This treaty was negotiated to prevent any unwanted activity on the continent and bans some forms of testing done there by member states. But the primary reason we can't just waltz into Antarctica is that it has a delicate ecosystem that needs protection. The treaty states that Antarctica should be used for peaceful purposes only and should be free from any human activity that could harm the environment. Scientists are still learning about the continent's unique ecosystem and our activity and machines could disrupt the delicate balance that exists there. If you're still itching to go to Antarctica, getting permission isn't exactly a walk in the park. U.S. citizens, for example, need to complete a special form and send it to the Office of Ocean and Polar Affairs. And once you're there, you'll need to follow some strict guidelines to protect the environment, like not disturbing any wildlife or taking souvenirs like rocks, plants, or animals. Now, technically, can you live in Antarctica? While there are no laws banning people from living there permanently, it's a very inhospitable environment and unsuitable for human habitation. Temperatures can reach negative 76 degrees Fahrenheit and below, making it nearly impossible for anyone to survive without the proper equipment and experience. Plus, the nearest piece of land is over 1,000 miles away making any inhabitants completely cut off from the rest of the world. Who knows, maybe one day we'll get the chance to visit this unique and fascinating continent. But until then, let's admire it from afar. Let's now talk a bit about the discovery of Antarctica. Unlike other places that were already inhabited, Antarctica never had a native human population. Ancient Greek philosophers had an idea about the continent and called it Antarctos, meaning opposite the bear. The bears it refers to are not the polar ones though, but rather the great and little bear constellations, which are only observable in the Northern Hemisphere. As a result, the term signifies the opposite of the land of the bear. Whaling and sealing voyages in the late 1700s and early 1800s would venture further south when rounding Cape Horn at the tip of South America. It was known that going further south often meant stronger winds, but also the risk of hitting floating ice of all sizes and of winds and seas that could prove dangerous to the ship and crew. Captain James Cook was the first to cross the Antarctic Circle on January 17, 1773, in the Ross Sea region. He reached a point further north a year later, and though he didn't sight land, he came to within 50 miles and saw deposits of rock held in icebergs, indicating that a more southerly land existed. The first sighting of Antarctica is widely acknowledged to have taken place in January of 1820, during the voyage of two ships under the command of Captain Fabian Gottlieb von Bellingshausen, as part of a two-year exploratory expedition around the world to discover new lands. The captain's ships were the first to have crossed the Antarctic Circle since Cook. The first undisputed landing on Antarctica didn't happen until much later, on January 24, 1895, at Cape Adare during the whaling voyage of the ship Antarctic led by Henrik Bull. A small boat with six or possibly seven men on board rowed ashore during calm conditions. You might not believe it, but Antarctica is actually a desert. With all that ice, you'd think it'd be like a winter wonderland with snowball fights and hot cocoa all day long. When we think of deserts, we picture camels and cacti and people struggling to find water. But in Antarctica, it's a whole different story. The struggle isn't to find water, it's to find anything that's not covered in ice. And the average rainfall has been just over 0.4 inches in the past 30 years. That's like a few drops of rain compared to what we're used to. So technically, it's not the dunes or sizzling heat that makes a desert, well, a desert. It's the lack of precipitation. But don't worry, if you ever find yourself lost in Antarctica, you won't have to worry about getting thirsty. Just make sure you bring a jacket and some mittens 
because it's cold enough to make you into a popsicle. Not only is Antarctica one of the driest places on Earth, but it's also the coldest, the windiest, and the highest. <laughs> Talk about overachieving. The penguins and scientists down in Antarctica have at times found themselves in a bit of a pickle when it comes to time. You see, unlike the rest of us on this big blue planet, there is no Antarctica time zone. All the lines of longitude meet at a single point at the South Pole, making it a bit of a head-scratcher when trying to figure out what time it is. Now, you might be thinking, but how do the scientists and researchers keep track of time down there? Good question. They typically stick to the time zone of the country they departed from. However, with stations from all over the world on the Antarctic Peninsula, things can get a little wacky. Imagine trying to coordinate with your neighboring countries without accidentally waking them up in the middle of the night. You might think that not much could survive in a place where the temperature is extremely cold, the sun barely shows up, and the wind could blow you away faster than a tumbleweed. Well, as in many places on Earth, life found a way in Antarctica too. Believe it or not, this frozen continent is buzzing with activity. It's home to billions of krill, which in turn attract lots of seals and more penguins than you can shake a fish at. But don't let their cute and cuddly appearance fool you. Penguins are the ultimate swimmers, with streamlined bodies that would make Olympic medal winners jealous. They come ashore to breed and chill, but their real talent is stealing pebbles from each other and forming mathematically precise huddles to stay warm. Antarctica is also home to the largest species of penguin on Earth. It's called the emperor penguin. Sure, these creatures are flightless birds, but that doesn't mean they can't jump. In fact, some of them can leap up to 120 inches. And let's not forget about the seals. With their furry bodies and special songs, these marine mammals are protected by the Antarctic Treaty, and they're thriving in the cool waters of the Southern Ocean, too. But the real stars of the show are the whales. During the Antarctic summer, these huge creatures show up in droves to chow down on the abundant krill. It's indeed like a whale buffet down there. On a sunny day, a man was diving in shallow waters near South Africa. At one point, he saw something that didn't catch his eye at first. A pile of shells that looked as if it had been put together. Maybe by some other diver, he must have told himself. But out of all these shells came the most unusual of creatures, an octopus. The gorgeous underwater animal looked straight at the man before swimming away. Impressed by his new acquaintance, the diver started visiting the octopus every day. He watched it use shells and seaweed to protect itself and learned how it hunted and cared for its eggs. All these encounters became the basis for a now famous documentary. In the movie, the diver wanted to study the relationship between a wild octopus and its observer. Initially, the octopus was a bit too shy to let the man get close. But over time, it began to trust him and even explored his body. At one point, the octopus even rested on the diver's chest. The man soon began to look at the underwater creature as his octopus friend. Sure, the documentary did make it look like a true friendship, but that was most likely because of all the close-ups and eerie music. But you can't really know what the octopus is thinking. Maybe what looks like tenderness is just curiosity or confusion. Maybe an apparent hug is really just a defense mechanism. Some people may love octopuses, but can they really be friends with a human? Until they learn to talk, I guess we'll never know. That doesn't make an octopus less of an interesting creature though. Apart from those quirky sets of tentacles, obviously, octopuses have another characteristic that sets them apart from other sea creatures. A recent study that involved studying the footage of octopuses living underwater shows that they sometimes develop this unusual behavior. They seem to throw things at each other on purpose. It can be anything from dirt from the bottom of the sea to shells or rocks. Octopuses are known to be solitary creatures, so when something or someone like an underwater camera person gets too close to them, they might lash out. 
Just as we have yet to discover the limits of our galaxies and constellations, we know very little about the bottom of the sea. It's one of the reasons why we find it so hard to explain the behavior of some underwater creatures. The truth is, we don't have good enough technology able to deal with harsh conditions and a limited amount of light underwater. You might have asked yourself at one point, what's the deepest part of the ocean? It's called the Mariana Trench. We don't really know exactly how deep this giant hole is since it's too difficult to measure, but it's somewhere around 6.8 miles deep and five times longer than the Grand Canyon. This massive underwater trench was first studied back in 1875 with the help of a weighted rope. Back in 2012, a Canadian film director reached the bottom of the trench in a submersible vessel called the Deep Sea Challenger. Some of the most bizarre creatures on the planet were discovered here, including the Dumbo octopus, the sea cucumber, and the goblin shark. The Mariana Trench got its name from the nearby Mariana Islands, which were named Las Marianas in honor of Spanish Queen Mariana of Austria. The Mariana Trench might be the deepest part of the ocean that we know of, but one other mysterious phenomenon that's interesting for researchers is called phantom bottoms. In the late 1940s, when the sonar became standard equipment, ships and submarines noticed unexpected signals coming from the ocean. Those signals came from areas where no seafloor was supposed to exist. What's even more mysterious is that this fake seafloor appeared to move. One researcher at Scripps University found out that these phantom bottoms showing on maps were indeed alive. They were made out of a layer of jellyfish, shrimps, and other deep sea creatures. The reason why they move is that they rise to the surface at night to feed. To top it all off, even the way these creatures move is kind of calculated. They don't just move randomly, but seem to gather together by species. We used to believe underwater animals behave this way only to avoid being caught by predators. It's a mystery to scientists why they group in the same way to form a fake seabed. Our curiosity about the deep waters doesn't stop at the seafloor. If you went on a vacation to the beach when you were young, you probably remember the fun of digging in the sand. As the hole got deeper, you may have asked yourself, could I dig all the way to the other side of the earth? None of us have ever found out. Our parents took us home when it got dark and chilly. Scientists are more reasonable when it comes to this subject. For starters, they know the best place to start digging would be underwater, since those regions are already deeper than what we can find on land. They also do not have the ambition to drill a tunnel through Earth. It's not even possible. That's mostly because of the extreme heat and pressure inside our planet. Even if we could technically dig a tunnel, it would not be safe to travel through it. However, Reaching the mantle and retrieving a sample would be a huge scientific achievement, similar to landing on the moon. What we live on is called Earth's crust. Underneath it, there are other layers called the mantle, outer core, and inner core. Researchers have been trying to drill into Earth's mantle since the 1960s, but they haven't succeeded. Some failed due to technical issues, and others were unlucky and chose the wrong places to drill. Our planet's mantle is made of molten rock. Wouldn't that be dangerous if we ever reached it? Scientists say we have nothing to worry about, though. If and when the drillers eventually pierce through the crust underwater, hot molten rock won't pop up the hole and spill onto the seafloor like it would during a volcanic eruption. Mantle rocks aren't solid, sure, but they move slowly, at the same speed as your fingernails grow. Another of those famous deep sea mysteries is that of the 1997 bloop. You heard that right. I'm talking about a weird sound that seemed to come from deep under the waves. People heard it in the South Pacific. No one had ever recounted a sound like that before. Some thought it must have been emitted by a strange creature living deep in the ocean. It didn't help that the noise came from a location mentioned in a story by famous writer H.P. Lovecraft. In his story, it was a creature called Cthulhu that lived there. 
In the novel, the author described it as a large, human-like monster with tentacles on its face and wings on its back. For many years, people tried to figure out where the noise came from. It wasn't until 2005 that they concluded it was from icebergs breaking off of glaciers. Some people still don't believe that this explanation truly makes sense and are searching for a different reason for the blue. If creatures living outside of our planet ever decided to come to visit, you wouldn't expect them to go straight to the bottom of the sea, right? Well, some people claim there's a sort of spaceship on the ocean floor, discovered in 2011. It's basically an oval-shaped object located on the bottom of the Baltic Sea. In 2012, a team of divers explored the anomaly and found what appeared to be a staircase and other structures on its surface. This only added to the belief that the large object had been made by someone and wasn't just a natural phenomenon. Even more bizarre, close to the unidentified anomaly, the explorer's electrical equipment, like sonar instruments and satellite phones, started to malfunction. Some scientists believe it just to be a glacial deposit or some other natural formation, but they still don't know for sure what it is. There's not much to do in Antarctica except scientific work. You could check out the wildlife, like some cute penguins and seals. And you'd get to see the occasional whale swimming around. Antarctica is one of the biggest lands out there that's only inhabited by scientists and researchers from all over the world. These scientists dug a hole through some pretty thick ice to study the ancient air and how the atmosphere cleans itself. They used a special drill and dug a clean cylindrical hole 450 feet below the surface. Some of this ice can be up to 800,000 years old and is a good indicator of what the climate was like in the past. It's like checking out tree rings to determine how old a certain tree is, except it's more complicated than that. After the effortless digging, they decided to drop some ice to the bottom of the hole to see what would happen next. They heard some really unusual sounds. It felt like being on a spaceship traveling through a bunch of obstacles with many rocks smashing into each other. The pitches changed over the quick descent of the block of ice, ranging from high pitch and ending with a low heartbeat-like sound. The scientists were puzzled when they first heard this and dropped some more ice, only to find out that the same type of sounds were being produced, just in different variations. They couldn't tell what was down there and, more importantly, why these kinds of sounds were produced. Antarctica boasts quite a few volcanoes, many of which are under super thick sheets of ice. Scientists discovered 91 volcanoes and claimed there could be more, potentially making it the most extensive volcanic region in the world. While they were doing regular scientific research, they came across many unmistakable large cone-shaped figures underground. Some were as deep as two miles in the ice. Some of the peaks were over 3,000 feet tall and dozens of miles across. But on the surface, it's as plain as a sheet of paper. They may have dropped that block of ice inside an actual volcano that they were standing on, but it's unlikely. Even though the underground volcano presence was discovered by accident, there's a small chance they were actually standing on one where they had their workstation set up. It's more likely that they worked in an area where studying ancient climates is easier and less dangerous than other places. They collect ice samples and study them in a lab. It's like discovering a prehistoric insect embedded in amber millions of years ago when dinosaurs used to roam the land. But instead of little bugs, scientists study ancient dust, air bubbles, sea salts, volcanic ash, and anything else that may have come from the environment they can practically tell how the climate was during that time. These ice samples might show that Antarctica's western ice sheet melted when the Earth's climate warmed up. If it did, then it's likely to happen again. That would mean sea levels rising, affecting coastal cities and small remote islands. But scientists aren't sure it's true, despite some evidence to back it up. The process of studying ice samples can take a week or even a year, depending on what they find. They crush or melt the sample bit by bit. And like those tree rings, the deeper the layer, the further we go back in time. 
In order to study ancient bubbles trapped in ice, researchers have to crush the samples under a vacuum hood to keep the air out while extracting the air and putting it in vials. There are various instruments and devices to study the ice samples, but because it's so sensitive to damage, each measurement must be in a clean room setting so that nothing gets compromised. The scientists have to wear proper body suits and many layers of gloves and constantly get ventilated. Even something as tiny and insignificant as a fingerprint can ruin a sample. They look for certain patterns to see changes in the atmosphere's composition and temperature. But dropping a few blocks of ice down a hole wouldn't be so bad. The reason why it made such a peculiar sound is the same reason why a moving car sounds different when it's honking than when it's stationary. The scientific word for it is the Doppler effect. It's an obvious change in the frequency of a wave with respect to an observer who is moving relative to the wave source. The effect doesn't mean the frequency of the sound changes, it just shifts. And this can be said about other types of waves, like water and light. But sound waves are the most popular ones when it comes to the Doppler effect. So, when the scientists dropped the ice block down the bottom of the hole, the sound waves traveled back up and bounced around the narrow tube where they drilled. That's why they got the pew pew sound. Let's not forget that this ice block traveled 450 feet beneath us. Oil ships dig holes in the oceanic crust that go thousands of feet beneath the Earth. The Kola Super Deep Borehole in Russia is the deepest hole ever made by humans. It goes more than 40,000 feet below the surface and took almost 20 years to reach 7.5 miles. Below it is only half the distance to the mantle. In terms of the whole Earth, this very deep hole is literally scratching the surface. This wasn't a hole to dig for oil and wasn't in the ocean either. The drilling was stopped in 1992 when the engineers found out that the temperatures were 100 degrees Fahrenheit higher than they predicted. And then it was abandoned, and it's just been a barren hole now. But that's the closest we've dug to the center of the planet. The scary thing is that some of the workers on the site could hear voices coming from within. All the way in Yemen, an ancient hole exists in Barhut, in the east of the country in the middle of the desert. It's actually closer to Oman than to the capital Sana'a. This hole has puzzled experts and locals. Unlike the holes in Russia and Antarctica, this wasn't man-made. Or was it? It's been around for many years, and the locals try to steer away from it. They don't even like talking about it, since they claim it brings bad luck to those around it or to whoever utters its name. They claim it was created as a prison for spirits, but many rule that out. The hole is 98 feet wide and somewhere between 330 to 650 feet deep. You can also hear strange sounds coming from the inside. But according to some scientists, the well has little to no ventilation and barely has any oxygen down there. So it's unlikely that anyone or anything lives down there. The Challenger Deep in the Mariana Trench caught some low-pitched grumble sounds in March of 2016. Some of these grumbles were followed by screeches. They caught these sounds in a span of weeks, using a titanium-encased microphone so that the immense pressure of the lowest point on Earth wouldn't crush it. They had to lower it slowly as well, since it's 1,000 times the atmospheric pressure at sea level. For 23 whole days, the microphone recorded typical sounds of whales passing by and boats sailing across from above, and even rumbles of nearby earthquakes. But they still couldn't determine what caused those initial sounds. The researchers couldn't understand if the noise from the bottom of the Mariana Trench was caused by humans or was natural. They also wanted to know if these sounds affected marine life, like dolphins and whales that rely on echolocation. They still can't figure it out. But scientists estimate that the ocean is about 10 times noisier than it was 50 years ago. With technological developments in shipping, submarines, and underwater construction, the ocean will only get louder with time. Northern lights come with sounds, which nobody talks about. They're usually audible when the auroras are at their most powerful presence. Scientists were always puzzled as to what caused the faint popping and crackling even though they were very far above us. They used some special microphones and found out that the sounds came just 230 feet above us, which is pretty low. 
They're caused by electrical charges gaining power in a specific region of the auroras. The electrical charges are disturbed by magnetic storms that fire up the northern lights. As a result, some tiny sparks are released into the atmosphere, causing the faint crackling and popping noise. Alert! Alert! Leave all your things behind and find safety immediately! The southern continent has just erupted! This is not a drill! You see people running around, screaming their heads out. Cars bumping into each other. The whole nation is in panic. You're on the southern coast of Australia, but the sky is black and it stretches further than your eye can see. Your friend in southern India calls you and says the same thing. There's ash in the sky and it's raining down on you. You hear rumbling in the distance and it isn't even your stomach to blame. Everyone starts running inland. The black clouds swallow up everything in sight. Cars, trees, buildings. You're unable to see anything in front of you. Everyone's confused and scared. A tsunami breaches the shores, covering everything in its path. This is the Great Antarctic Eruption. Antarctica is that big continental desert covered in ice. In fact, it's technically the largest desert in the world. It's also covered with a whole lot of volcanoes just chilling around. Scientists discovered that there are 138 volcanoes in Antarctica, 91 of which are hidden beneath the icy surface, and 47 on top. And there might even be more. But most of these volcanoes are dormant. And for a volcano to be dormant, it has to be fast asleep for the last 50,000 years. The last volcano eruption was Mount Erebus in the western part of the continent. It's the most active volcano in the south side of the world and is roughly 12,500 feet above sea level. That's as high as stacking the Burj Khalifa on top of itself five times. There's a whole bunch of these volcanoes stretched across the entire continent. In the most concentrated region, the volcanoes spread the distance equivalent to that between Canada and Mexico. And that's not even all of them. Scientists have warned that if any of these interior ice-contained volcanoes were to erupt, they'd melt the western Antarctic part of the land and increase the spill of ice into the ocean. It would raise the sea level and flood many endangered lands that are already at risk. And that's not mentioning the tectonic plates shifting underneath the surface, which allows some of the magma to squeeze its way to some surfaces. It's scary enough to expect what would happen if a huge volcano erupted. But what would happen if all the volcanoes in the Antarctic continent erupted at the same time? If you were one of those scientists on a boat on their way to conduct some experiments, you would begin to feel unease. You'd notice the water carrying a bit more of the current than usual. You look at your fellow scientists, and they too have the same look on their faces. As you land at the shore and take out all your tools and equipment, things don't seem normal but the work has to be done. You head to the base and settle in, business as usual. In the barren land, you see some emperor penguins waddling around, hunting, playing, and doing penguin stuff. But as you look around, you notice that the penguins all suddenly head to the ocean, and many of the wild Antarctic birds also begin flying towards the horizon. Weird. Then, the ground starts shaking, and behind you appears a tower of smoke reaching to the sky. The ashes from a volcano can be very harmful for anyone with lung conditions, and even healthy people. The gases that come with it are usually blown away quickly, but are also harmful to humans and cause irritation to the eyes and throat. But if you're nearby, you may need a gas mask. Or, better yet, evacuate! The gases and ashes are the most dangerous part of a volcanic eruption. Even though the lava spewing and explosion may seem scary, the smoke in the sky can spread far away and even halt planes flying around. You look to your fellow scientists and they signal to you that it's time to go. Make like the penguins and swim off. But the waters are extremely rough and the rumbling's getting louder and louder. Suddenly, you see more smoke wafting towards the sky but from different locations. Back to the boat! It's sad to say, but leaving all that equipment was needed to survive. Carrying all that stuff would have slowed you down, but you're safe, for now. Looking behind you, you see a dark smoke screen covering every corner of the continent. 
volcanoes have different types of eruptions. It's not just the shooting out lava into the sky scenario. They can range from aggressive to calm. Some spew out lava and some don't. This all depends on the environment, the number of gases contained, or if there's any groundwater present, and even the chemistry of the magma. So chances are you'd be seeing all various types of explosions around you. You're out of Antarctica's mainland, but it's surrounded by lagoons and giant ice caps all around. You're doing your best to maneuver around them, but the ash is falling down all around. The sky is dark as the smoke blocks out the sun. Volcanic ash comes in all sizes and can cause different damage, from as little as lung and eye irritation to smothering vegetation and crops. And that's just the thing. More often than not, these volcanic ashes are extremely thick. They can even collapse the roofing of some buildings if a lot of ash is accumulated. Not to mention blocking roads and compromising aquatic life. And that flash in the sky isn't your imagination. Ash clouds in the sky are so powerful that they create electrical fields that can create lightning storms. And these bad boys can interfere with radio signals and even start fires. Also, these clouds are extremely hot on their own. As if that lava flow isn't enough to start any fires. Oh well. But there are some volcanoes that are explosive, and along with the ashes flying around. There are flying rocks. This overheated rubble comes striking down like meteoroids from the sky, and can be pretty dangerous. You see the rocks hit the surrounding ice caps and water around you. As you reach a somewhat safe zone, you see the volcanoes all nicely lined up behind you, spewing all that thick red gooey fire. But the water tide isn't exactly peaceful. Volcanoes near oceans and seas can even cause tsunamis. Great. Submarine earthquakes shake the ocean bottom and produce large, powerful waves, and don't even think about surfing on them. If there are volcanoes spitting out red-hot lava, then why hasn't all the ice in Antarctica melted? The answer lies beneath the Earth's surface. Tectonic plates barely move underneath there. It's pretty safe to say they're stable. So, for such a large piece of land, the coldest continent on Earth. The few active volcanoes are insufficient to melt all the ice. The real reason why the ice is melting and water levels are rising is the warm ocean current around Antarctica. But this time, they're all erupting at the same time. With the volcanoes discovered, who knows how many are left underground, covered in ice? And that's the scary part. Some of these volcanoes are hidden so deep beneath the icy surface that they now heat up from the lava spewing out. The ice begins to destabilize everything around. The ice on the ridges begins cracking open, little by little, like giant cans of soda bursting open. Lava shoots from the snowy depths, causing enormous cracks in the ground. And then, magma finds its way to the party. This uninvited guest will begin to melt the surroundings, causing the ground to destabilize even more. Slowly but surely, the ice around Antarctica will melt. And if all the ice is melted, the Earth's sea level would rise by around 230 feet. That means coastal cities would be submerged underwater. The ocean currents would be flipped around, and hurricanes and typhoons would not want to take a break. Marine life would be in danger, and many small islands would completely disappear. And not to mention the smoke in the air that would travel around the world, halting many flights in the southern region. And if the winds were strong enough, the whole world. The economies would flop, and a worldwide panic would begin. Health emergencies all year round. Yeah, a real nice picture. In November 1922, a boy walked through the desert mountains of Egypt and discovered some ancient steps carved into the rock. Subsequently, this find became one of the world's largest and most significant archaeological discoveries. This step was part of Tutankhamun's untouched tomb. Archaeologists found about 5,000 ancient objects, including jewelry, fabrics, painted vases, and funeral masks. You've probably seen one of them. It has become one of the most recognizable attributes of ancient Egypt. More than a hundred years have passed since then, and now humanity has finally become close to another large-scale discovery: the tomb of Cleopatra. This queen was the last active ruler of the Ptolemaic Kingdom of Egypt, 
who sat on the throne from 51 to 30 BCE. There are many ancient records about Cleopatra, her reign, and her unusual personality. But until now, no one has discovered the secrets about her passing away in the burial place. So, one archaeologist, Dr. Kathleen Martinez, has been studying ancient records and temples around Alexandria for decades and concluded that the tomb of the queen should be located under the ancient city of Taposiris Magna, founded in 280 BCE. It was a big city on the northern coast of Egypt where tens of thousands of people were engaged in trade and industry. And it seems that Dr. Martinez's guesses turned out to be correct. She and a group of archaeologists have discovered a secret underground tunnel near Alexandria with a length of about 0.8 miles. It was cut into the rock under Taposiris Magna's temple. During further excavations, they found many things that indicate Cleopatra's tomb lies in the tunnel's depths. It's also possible that she is buried there together with the Roman commander, Mark Antony. According to ancient records, Cleopatra and Mark Antony loved each other and together opposed the Roman Senate, which declared Antony a traitor. The fact that natural disasters have occurred on the territory of Taposiris Magna for thousands of years can complicate the excavations. Earthquakes and floods destroyed the city and possibly flooded its underground tunnels. But archaeologists hope the ancient tomb remains untouched and that it hides many treasures and records about the royal life of ancient Egypt during the reign of the last dynasty. There's a chance that excavations will go underwater and in the mud. This will require much time and funding, but archaeologists are sure it's worth it. Anyway, it's too early to say that Cleopatra is really buried there, but scientists have found many things in the tunnel that confirm this, including clay pots, dozens of coins with the image of Cleopatra and Alexander the Great, as well as a bust with the image of the Egyptian queen. Cleopatra is still one of the most popular personalities in Egypt, on an equal footing with Rameses III and Tutankhamun. She inspired many films, paintings, and books. But what made her so popular? She became famous for her inconsistency. She was a beautiful, intelligent ruler who pulled Egypt out of the crisis and made it a prosperous power. Medieval Arabic texts say she knew chemistry, mathematics, and philosophy, and may have written several scientific books. She knew several languages and had excellent diplomatic skills. At the same time, there are many legends that she was a femme fatale who drove many men crazy. However, there's no evidence that her beauty was incomparable. The image of a stunning model was created by Hollywood when it made several films where famous actresses performed the role of Cleopatra. And the Roman Emperor Octavian, the adopted son of Julius Caesar, specially created the image of Cleopatra as an insidious seductress because he was her enemy. Even though she was born in Egypt, Cleopatra wasn't an Egyptian. Her ancestors were Greeks, among whom was one of the generals of Alexander the Great. However, the people of Egypt loved her. She learned the language and was very sensitive to the traditions of this country. She knew the history, mentality, and customs of ancient Egypt well. She raised the level of its economy and strengthened its status as a world power. Much of this was made possible thanks to her cunning and impressiveness. She loved theatrical performances and lavish celebrations. She knew how to surprise people and put on a show. But behind the exterior image of a luxury lover was an intelligent and calculating ruler. Ancient Egypt was a rich, luxurious country and Cleopatra did everything to increase its wealth and strengthen its position in the international arena. For example, she was once in conflict with her brother Ptolemy XIII Odd. The queen knew that she wouldn't be able to resist him, so she decided to attract Julius Caesar to their side. The Roman emperor arrived in Alexandria, where Cleopatra wanted to meet him, but Ptolemy knew about her plans and was about to prevent her from coming to Caesar. Then, instead of a rich and noisy arrival, Cleopatra decided to make her visit inconspicuous. She wrapped herself in a carpet or linen bag the emperor's servants carried into Caesar's private chambers. Cleopatra emerged from the carpet and impressed the Roman emperor with her beauty and determination. As a result, they fell in love with each other and became close allies. After some time, she impressed another influential Roman for diplomatic purposes. 
She arrived to meet Mark Antony on a golden barge with purple sails and silver oars. Cleopatra was dressed in the image of Aphrodite and sat under a magnificent canopy. Her servants dressed like cupids and were blowing her fan and burning incense. But Cleopatra created such a show for a reason. She knew that Antony revered Greek mythology and considered himself the embodiment of Dionysus. As a result, he was so impressed with this woman that he ended up marrying her. Cleopatra defended her crown, strengthened her alliance with Rome, and bore Antony three children. In Egypt, they threw big parties and enjoyed wealth with power. However, the relationship of a high-ranking official with the Egyptian queen caused a scandal in Rome. Octavian was Antony's primary opponent in the struggle for power, so he exploited the situation to darken the competitor's reputation. He used propaganda to make Cleopatra an insidious seductress in the eyes of Roman citizens. He accused Antony of succumbing to her charms. The Roman Senate supported Octavian and declared Cleopatra an enemy. In 33 BCE, this conflict reached a high point when Antony's navy clashed with Octavian's fleet. The latter won and forced his enemy to flee to Egypt with Cleopatra. According to some records, they took refuge near Alexandria. Pursued by the Romans, they hid in one of Cleopatra's palaces and met their end. Some legends say that Cleopatra was an expert in poisons. She provoked a venomous snake, a viper or an Egyptian cobra, to bite her. Also, according to another legend, she pricked herself with a poisonous needle. There's a theory that Cleopatra always carried an ampule with poison inside her hairbrush. And when she was cornered, she soaked the needle with this poison and pricked herself. None of this can be said for sure. Scientists are still trying to find out the truth. Perhaps when they reach Cleopatra's tomb, the world will get more answers about her tragic fate. She is considered the last ruler of Egypt. After her passing, Octavian plundered her palaces and temples and returned to Rome, where he became the main emperor. He successfully ruled the country and expanded its borders. His reign ended when he turned 75. World history would have looked different if Cleopatra and Mark Antony hadn't lost that naval battle. By the way, did you know that more time has passed between Cleopatra's reign and Neil Armstrong's flight to the moon than between the reign of the Egyptian queen and the construction of the Great Pyramid of Giza? Armstrong took a step on the Earth's satellite in 1969, 2038 years after the birth of Cleopatra. And the construction of the pyramid took place in 2560 BCE. Imagine how long the history of ancient Egypt is. Cleopatra is closer to us in time than to the pyramids. We're in Siberia. It's so cold here that freezing gusts of wind are burning your face. All that white snow seems to be blinding you. This place resembles Antarctica because of the permafrost. Recently, a group of scientists researched one of the local rivers. With the help of a drilling rig, they extracted several samples of frozen soil. The scientists were shocked to find living creatures inside the ice. Later in the laboratory, they realized that the creatures were microscopic multi-celled organisms known as deloid rotifers. These creatures looked like little worms. Scientists knew that these worms could live in frozen conditions for up to 10 years. But the age of the rotifers found in the ice was about 24,000 years. And after defrosting, they began to reproduce, as if they had been sleeping for several hours, not thousands of years. Further analysis showed that these organisms could stay frozen for hundreds of thousands of years. The rotifers might have lived during the time when people didn't invent the wheel yet. And this isn't their only superpower. Deloid rotifers are among the most radioactively resistant animals on Earth. They can survive in places where there's no oxygen and water. They can also stay alive in areas with high acidity and can live without food and water for a long time. By the way, these are not the only creatures that are known for living for thousands of years. Particular types of moss and some microorganisms are also almost immortal. Nematodes, also called roundworms, are some of the most adaptive varieties of worms in the world. Imagine the Eiffel Tower, standing tall and proud. And now, let's make it 10 times higher and place it underground. Exactly at this depth, many thousands of feet under the surface, scientists discovered these creatures. There's no sunlight and almost no air in this place. And since it's much closer to Earth's core than the surface of our planet, the temperature here is higher than in the middle of the hottest desert. 
millions of tons of soil above create insane pressure. But all this couldn't prevent life from developing here. When roundworms run out of air, food, or when the temperature becomes too high, they get into a unique state of stasis, or deep hibernation. In this mode, the worm's metabolism slows down, and almost all the processes in their bodies stop. The creatures can sleep for a very long time, and only wake up when the environment becomes more livable. By the way, you don't have to go so deep underground to find these creatures. Nematodes are found all over the world. They can live in hot springs, deserts, high in the mountains, among the harsh ices of Antarctica, or inside animals and humans. Our next invulnerable creatures are tardigrades, also known as water bears. These are microscopic eight-legged invertebrates, closely related to arthropods. It's impossible to see them with the unaided eye. But a conventional microscope will allow you to see tardigrades in detail. They look like minuscule bears. They're called water bears because they need a thin layer of water around their bodies at all times. It's necessary to prevent dehydration. Tardigrades have been found in all kinds of environments, from ocean depths to sand dunes. They're incredibly robust thanks to their unique organism structure. Yeah, they look soft, but their body is covered with a tough cuticle. This coating resembles the exoskeletons of grasshoppers, mantises, and many other insects. Water bears shed their old layer of the cuticle when they need to grow. Each of their eight legs has four to six claws, which helps them cling to any surface. The bears can survive at a temperature that's almost three times as cold as the temperature in the ice of Antarctica. Heat doesn't harm them either. They have been proved to survive at the temperature that makes water boil. Also, water bears are not afraid of radiation and high pressure. In the depths of the ocean, pressure can destroy alloys of the strongest metals. But these creatures can withstand pressures six times greater. But the coolest thing is that they can live in the vacuum of space. Our planet has a magnetic field. This is a shield that protects us from solar radiation. Tardigrades don't need this protection. They can go into near-Earth orbit and come back unharmed, all thanks to a protein protecting their DNA from ionizing radiation. Like other immortal organisms, water bears can fall into a state of cryptobiosis. Tardigrades pull their head and legs inside their bodies and fall asleep. If the surrounding conditions suggest freezing, drying out, or experiencing a lack of oxygen, they will remain in this barrel form until the situation improves. So those are microscopic organisms and microbes that can only be seen through a microscope. But how about something bigger? Meet ironclad beetles. They live in the southwestern US and Mexico. These insects can not survive high temperatures, live without oxygen, or in conditions of increased radiation. But their shells are so tough that they can only be pierced with a drill or hammer. Their durable exoskeletons are made of a special substance chitin. It can also be found in the armor of crabs or shrimp. And still, the chitin of the ironclad beetle is so durable that it allows this creature to withstand the impact of a car moving at high speed. In times of danger, they can hide their whiskers and strong legs in special recesses in their shell. Other animals can't bite through the armor, so they spit the beetle out and leave to look for lunch somewhere else. As soon as the danger disappears, the bug stretches out its legs again and goes about its business. Also, the armor saves the beetles from dehydration, which is very useful in hot areas of Mexico and the southwestern US. Inside the exoskeleton, they can store moisture. In other words, these bugs can absorb water whenever they find it and transport this liquid inside themselves. The next creatures are incredibly fragile but they know how to survive in places where almost no other animals can live. We're going to the southeast of Romania, near the Black Sea. Here, on a desolate wide plain, you can notice a pit. This is a mine leading deep underground. The air on the surface of our planet usually contains around 20% oxygen, but in the mine, it's only 10%. Inside the cave, the air also has an increased content of hydrogen sulfide and carbon dioxide people can't breathe there without an oxygen tank. We can probably say that the water and air there are poisoned. Almost no animals would be able to survive here. Still, 48 species of living organisms have been found in this cave. 33 of them are newly discovered species. 
And they aren't the only microbes or bacteria that can't be seen without a microscope. Something bigger lives here. Strange white snails crawl over the walls of the mines. Transparent shrimp and a bunch of unknown kind of leeches swim in the water. White centipedes with huge whiskers and creepy white spiders run on the ground. And they all have been growing here for almost 5 million years. You might notice a water scorpion and another unidentified species of this animal. It doesn't look like its relatives living in hot sands or tropical forests. No living creature here looks ordinary at all. All animals are either white or transparent. They have no eyes, but are equipped with long paws and antennae whiskers that help them navigate in this dark space. The deeper you go into the cave, the less oxygen the air contains. But the number of living organisms is increasing. The air is filled with methane and carbon dioxide. All the inhabitants of this cave have never seen the light of the sun and have never gone out of the darkness. It seems impossible to survive in such conditions where plants don't produce oxygen. The answer to the question of their survival is hidden in a small lake. The surface of the water is covered with strange foam. If you look closely, you can see that this white substance is alive. It resembles soft, wet paper that is easy to tear. The thing is billions of living organisms, bacteria called autotrophs. There's much more carbon dioxide in the cave than there is outside. And these bacteria, like plants, absorb it. But they don't do this with the help of photosynthesis, which means they don't need sunlight. They use water for chemosynthesis. What these bacteria secrete is food for other bacteria. And these other bacteria are food for bigger creatures. A unique food cycle that you can't find anywhere else on the planet only exists here. There's not much to do in Antarctica except scientific work. You could check out the wildlife, like some cute penguins and seals. And you'd get to see the occasional whale swimming around. Antarctica is one of the biggest lands out there that's only inhabited by scientists and researchers from all over the world. These scientists dug a hole through some pretty thick ice to study the ancient air and how the atmosphere cleans itself. They used a special drill and dug a clean cylindrical hole 450 feet below the surface. Some of this ice can be up to 800,000 years old and is a good indicator of what the climate was like in the past. It's like checking out tree rings to determine how old a certain tree is, except it's more complicated than that. After the effortless digging, they decided to drop some ice to the bottom of the hole to see what would happen next. They heard some really unusual sounds. It felt like being on a spaceship traveling through a bunch of obstacles with many rocks smashing into each other. The pitches changed over the quick descent of the block of ice, ranging from high pitch and ending with a low heartbeat-like sound. The scientists were puzzled when they first heard this and dropped some more ice, only to find out that the same type of sounds were being produced, just in different variations. They couldn't tell what was down there and, more importantly, why these kinds of sounds were produced. Antarctica boasts quite a few volcanoes, many of which are under super thick sheets of ice. Scientists discovered 91 volcanoes and claimed there could be more, potentially making it the most extensive volcanic region in the world. While they were doing regular scientific research, they came across many unmistakable large cone-shaped figures underground. Some were as deep as two miles in the ice. Some of the peaks were over 3,000 feet tall and dozens of miles across. But on the surface, it's as plain as a sheet of paper. They may have dropped that block of ice inside an actual volcano that they were standing on, but it's unlikely. Even though the underground volcano presence was discovered by accident, there's a small chance they were actually standing on one where they had their workstation set up. It's more likely that they worked in an area where studying ancient climates is easier and less dangerous than other places. They collect ice samples and study them in a lab. It's like discovering a prehistoric insect embedded in amber millions of years ago when dinosaurs used to roam the land. But instead of little bugs, scientists study ancient dust, air bubbles, sea salts, volcanic ash, and anything else that may have come from the environment they can practically tell how the climate was during that time. 
These ice samples might show that Antarctica's western ice sheet melted when the Earth's climate warmed up. If it did, then it's likely to happen again. That would mean sea levels rising, affecting coastal cities and small remote islands. But scientists aren't sure it's true, despite some evidence to back it up. The process of studying ice samples can take a week or even a year, depending on what they find. They crush or melt the sample bit by bit. And like those tree rings, the deeper the layer, the further we go back in time. In order to study ancient bubbles trapped in ice, researchers have to crush the samples under a vacuum hood to keep the air out while extracting the air and putting it in vials. There are various instruments and devices to study the ice samples, but because it's so sensitive to damage, each measurement must be in a clean room setting so that nothing gets compromised. The scientists have to wear proper body suits and many layers of gloves and constantly get ventilated. Even something as tiny and insignificant as a fingerprint can ruin a sample. They look for certain patterns to see changes in the atmosphere's composition and temperature. But dropping a few blocks of ice down a hole wouldn't be so bad. The reason why it made such a peculiar sound is the same reason why a moving car sounds different when it's honking than when it's stationary. The scientific word for it is the Doppler effect. It's an obvious change in the frequency of a wave with respect to an observer who is moving relative to the wave source. The effect doesn't mean the frequency of the sound changes, it just shifts. And this can be said about other types of waves, like water and light. But sound waves are the most popular ones when it comes to the Doppler effect. So, when the scientists dropped the ice block down the bottom of the hole, the sound waves traveled back up and bounced around the narrow tube where they drilled. That's why they got the pew pew sound. Let's not forget that this ice block traveled 450 feet beneath us. Oil ships dig holes in the oceanic crust that go thousands of feet beneath the Earth. The Kola Super Deep Borehole in Russia is the deepest hole ever made by humans. It goes more than 40,000 feet below the surface and took almost 20 years to reach 7.5 miles. Below it is only half the distance to the mantle. In terms of the whole Earth, this very deep hole is literally scratching the surface. This wasn't a hole to dig for oil and wasn't in the ocean either. The drilling was stopped in 1992 when the engineers found out that the temperatures were 100 degrees Fahrenheit higher than they predicted. And then it was abandoned, and it's just been a barren hole now. But that's the closest we've dug to the center of the planet. The scary thing is that some of the workers on the site could hear voices coming from within. All the way in Yemen, an ancient hole exists in Barhut, in the east of the country in the middle of the desert. It's actually closer to Oman than to the capital Sana'a. This hole has puzzled experts and locals. Unlike the holes in Russia and Antarctica, this wasn't man-made. Or was it? It's been around for many years, and the locals try to steer away from it. They don't even like talking about it, since they claim it brings bad luck to those around it or to whoever utters its name. They claim it was created as a prison for spirits, but many rule that out. The hole is 98 feet wide and somewhere between 330 to 650 feet deep. You can also hear strange sounds coming from the inside. But according to some scientists, the well has little to no ventilation and barely has any oxygen down there. So it's unlikely that anyone or anything lives down there. The Challenger Deep in the Mariana Trench caught some low-pitched grumble sounds in March of 2016. Some of these grumbles were followed by screeches. They caught these sounds in a span of weeks using a titanium encased microphone so that the immense pressure of the lowest point on Earth wouldn't crush it. They had to lower it slowly as well, since it's 1,000 times the atmospheric pressure at sea level. For 23 whole days, the microphone recorded typical sounds of whales passing by and boats sailing across from above, and even rumbles of nearby earthquakes. But they still couldn't determine what caused those initial sounds. The researchers couldn't understand if the noise from the bottom of the Mariana Trench was caused by humans or was natural. They also wanted to know if these sounds affected marine life, like dolphins and whales that rely on echolocation. They still can't figure it out. 
but scientists estimate that the ocean is about 10 times noisier than it was 50 years ago. With technological developments in shipping, submarines, and underwater construction, the ocean will only get louder with time. Northern lights come with sounds, which nobody talks about. They're usually audible when the auroras are at their most powerful presence. Scientists were always puzzled as to what caused the faint popping and crackling, even though they were very far above us. They used some special microphones and found out that the sounds came just 230 feet above us, which is pretty low. They're caused by electrical charges gaining power in a specific region of the auroras. The electrical charges are disturbed by magnetic storms that fire up the northern lights. As a result, some tiny sparks are released into the atmosphere, causing the faint crackling and popping noise. 